as we were singing that great worship song, How Great Is Our God, I was thinking to myself, it's not a Christmas song, but it really could be, because that's uh, why we celebrate at Christmas time every year, the coming of Christ in the world, because that's an expression of the greatness of our God. I've seen several Chapel Streeters around since uh, what we call Christmas Eve weekend now, uh, and they've asked me, well, how did it all go? Twelve services over three campuses in three days. How did it all go? Well, we had a fantastic weekend, just to give you a little picture of it. In those 12 services over three days, we had over 5,000 people attend, which is uh, a landmark weekend in the life of the church. But even better than that, even better than that, more important than that, you know, we set a goal of trying to raise $65,000 to build a second home to care for homeless boys in Rwanda, where Amanda Good works with Hope for Life, one of our Serve the World partners. We wanted to raise $65,000 during Christmas season for that purpose. Well, by the time we got to Christmas Eve, I texted Jeff and said, hey, Jeff, where are we? And he texted back, we're already over $100,000 before we even got to Christmas Eve. So I don't even know where it is. We'll tell you with that next week. But we're pressing as an all-time record. So thank you very much for your generosity. We're going to build a second house in Rwanda. So thank you for your generosity. Well, when I was 25 years old, I had two college degrees and was finishing a master's degree and had no job. Uh, at least not a job where I made any money anyway. I was a volunteer assistant basketball coach at Taylor University down in Indiana. I was working as a substitute teacher in local middle schools and high schools. And I was struggling, you know, to pay for my classes, struggling to pay for my apartment, struggling really literally even to eat. And I was, in those days, what they would call today uh, an emerging adult. Have you heard that phrase? Emerging adulthood. Uh, developmental psychologists now identified a phase of life between adolescence and full independent adulthood called emerging adulthood, people between the ages of 18 and 29. How many of you here today, very between 18 and 29? Okay, I'm, I'm so glad you're here um, because I'm going to tell you a story about my life at that time. But a generation or two ago, people were expected to go, young people in our culture were expected to go straight from adolescence to adulthood right? You graduated high school, got a job, got married, had kids, boom, adulthood. The average age for marriage in 1960 in our culture was 20 years old for women and 22 for men. Today, it's about 30 for both. And there's lots of reasons for this cultural shift, changes in the economy, changes in education, need for more education, the expense of education, there's college debts, needing to work those off. It just takes longer to navigate that passageway from adolescence when you live at home with mom and dad to full independent adulthood. It's just so hard today. So I like to think of myself as being ahead of the curve. I was emerging adult before they even knew it was a thing. <laughs> so if you are in that phase of life, I'm with you all the way. I know that it's a tough stage of life. So I decided I needed a real job. So I made an appointment with the president of Taylor University, a man at the time whose name was Milo Rediger, Dr. Milo Rediger. I can only find this picture of him. He passed away a number of years ago. Uh, he was a sweet man, man of great accomplishment in the Christian world, had served as president previously at Taylor several decades earlier, uh, and had come out of retirement to be interim for a year or two while they searched for another president. My mother, in fact, had worked as his secretary her first year at Taylor in the mid-1950s, and I figured that was my ticket. I was going to go into his office, explain who I was, who my mom was, and I was going to convince him that I was a great guy and he should give me a job. So I walked into his office, did my best to convince him that it had to be something I could do around this great Christian university for which he could pay me. And when I was finished with my little speech, Dr. Rediger leaned back in his chair and said something that I still remember almost word for word. He said, young man, I'm 79 years old. And when I look back across my life, the years between when I was 20 and 30, roughly that stage of life that I was in right then, those years, he said, while I lived them, they were a great waste, I thought. He said, however, looking back from my vantage point now, I think they were the most productive time in my life. He said, God bless you. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> I walked in looking for a job. I walked out without a job, but he gave me something better. Now, I didn't recognize it at the time, but today at age 62, looking back, Dr. Rediger was right. Those years of frustration and difficulty and struggle were productive in a way I didn't see at the time. God was doing something beneath the surface of my life that I just didn't know for a while. 
And that story always reminds me of the story we're going to look at today, a conversation between two young men and Jesus, two young men who are ambitious and looking for a job, trying to be significant, wanting to be important. And this is what Jesus has to say to them. I'm going to read the whole story and then break it down and we'll see what we can learn today. Mark chapter 10. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many." So you need to know this conversation happens right at the very end of Jesus' earthly ministry. He's just a couple of weeks from the cross and the resurrection. In fact, earlier in this very chapter, he's been teaching them about the eternal kingdom of God. He's actually referenced his coming arrest, even his death. And then seemingly out of nowhere, these two young guys, James and John, pipe up with what sounds like an outrageous demand. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, just think about that just for a moment. What if a child came to his or her parent with that same thought? Say, Dad, I'd like for you to do for me whatever I want. Now, what father in their right mind goes, okay, shoot, let's have it. What comes next? Car? Credit cards? Probably both. Or what employee goes to an employer and says to the boss, hey boss, I would like you to do for me whatever I ask. You know, a company car, end of the year bonus, 30 weeks paid vacation. <laughs> How that's gonna go? How's that gonna go? What are these guys thinking? Now we're told that James and John are brothers, sons of a man named Zebedee. We know from other places Zebedee was a fisherman. So the boys are working in their dad's fishing business when Jesus calls them. They're among the first to follow him, and along with Peter, form the very core, the three inner circle guys that were closest to Jesus throughout his ministry. We know from the Gospel of Mark that Jesus even developed his own nickname for these two brothers, James and John. He called them Sons of Thunder. We're not really sure why, but we have a hint in Luke chapter 9 when Jesus is traveling, he's not received well in a village in Samaria, and these two brothers, the sons of thunder, come to him and say, Lord, you want us to call on fire and just scorch this place? <laughs> sons of thunder. And Jesus had to sort of talk them off the ledge. No, that's not really my strategy here. Here they approach Jesus with a surprisingly bold demand. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, in their defense, James and John had been with Jesus for a little over three years at this point. They've seen him do all kinds of amazing stuff. They've watched him heal the sick. They've watched him feed thousands of people with just a sack lunch. Uh, they know and believe he's the Messiah, the anointed one of God, come to save his people. They believe he's going to be king. That's good. Therefore, they believe he has the power and the authority to do anything, including anything they ask or want. What they don't yet fully understand is the kind of king Jesus is. And so Jesus responds to their demand by asking a revealing question. And that's where I want to start today, a revealing question. Uh, a year or so before I barged into Dr. Rediger's office looking for a job, I was taking classes at Taylor toward a second undergrad degree in Bible literature, and I took a class, um, and by the way, Chris, Taylor is a great Christian university. Do we have any Taylor, Taylor families here with a kid or somebody's gone to Taylor? How many Taylor connections do we have here? 
That was a great Christian university, been around for 150 years or so. My parents met there, and my brother, we, we have a long family connection there. Um, but I was there in the 1980s when um, it was very, uh, when the phrase, Jesus is the answer, was quite common in, in Christian circles. Uh, it wasn't uncommon to see it on t-shirts, bumper stickers, Jesus is the answer. And so the first day of class came in this one semester, I was taking a class called Theological Foundations, I think, and a very popular professor on campus was teaching the class. So first day, first day, doesn't say anything else. He just walks up to the blackboard and writes in big letters, we had blackboards back in those days, writes on the blackboard, Jesus is not the answer. Doesn't say a word, just writes it up there and turns around. And you could, you could feel the discomfort in the class. You could almost hear the the, the brains worry, like, what? what? What's he saying? Was he lost his faith? Has he lost his mind? What's he talking about? And then after 30 seconds of discomfort or so, he walked back to the blackboard and wrote, Jesus is always the question. And he went on to explain to us that before we can make the claim, Jesus is the answer, we have to understand the questions. By the way, that's why we as a church are doing the Explore God initiative starting in a couple of weeks. We think it's important to ask questions before we provide answers. Ask questions like, does life have a purpose? Can I know God personally? Why does God allow suffering and evil in the world? These are the questions people have. Sometimes we don't ask them out loud, but that's how we grow. That's how we learn. That's how we understand. In fact, Jesus loved to ask questions himself. If you circled every question Jesus asks in the New Testament, you would come up with about 300 questions that he asks. He was a rabbi. He loved to teach by asking questions. Let me give you a a bit of a sample. In John chapter 1, right at the beginning of the story, when John the Baptist points to Jesus, who no one knows yet, that nobody knows who he is yet, John the Baptist points at him and says, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Andrew, this young man, overhears that. He follows after Jesus because he's curious. Jesus turns around and says, what do you seek? What are you looking for? It's a question of purpose. Jesus comes upon a man in John chapter 5 who's been paralyzed for 38 years. Jesus looks at him and asks a strange question. He says, do you want to get well? It's a question of courage. Because if he gets well, he has to live a new kind of life. And then in Matthew chapter 16, he looks at his closest followers and says, who do you say that I am? It's a question of theology. And then in John 20, when Mary Magdalene, after the crucifixion, goes to his tomb, Jesus asks her a question, woman, why are you weeping? It's a question of pain and loss and grief. Luke 24, several women come to the tomb, find it empty. An angel greets them with a question, why do you look for the living among the dead? It's a question of resurrection. In Matthew 14, Peter tries to walk to Jesus on water. Remember that story? He gets afraid. He begins to sink. Jesus says, why are you afraid? Why did you doubt? It's a question of faith and trust. And then finally, in Mark 4, the disciples are caught in a storm on the Sea of Galilee, and they're terrified. Jesus calms the wind and the sea by speaking, and then looks at them and says, why are you so afraid? The question of trust. See, sometimes I think we assume that to come to faith in Jesus, to follow him, means that we have no more questions. That somehow in church we're not allowed to ask questions like that, at least not out loud. Well, it's not not true. Questions are how we grow. Questions are powerful. Questions are are that which reveals our inner thoughts, our hopes, our dreams, our motivations. Questions call us to confession. So when James and John come to him with this demand, Jesus asks a question. What do you want me to do for you? Notice, he doesn't promise to give them what they ask. He doesn't tell them it's a dumb thing to ask for. He just wants them to be honest. Tell me what you want. Here's a thought. What if Jesus today could come to you personally And he would use your name, I think. And he says, your name, he says, so tell me, what do you want me to do for you today? What do you want me to do for you? Because your answer to that question would tell you something about yourself, what you think is important in your life. It will tell you where your heart is. It would also tell you what you think about Jesus. 
of what he has to give. So Jesus just wants these guys to be honest with him, so he asks a revealing question. And that leads to the second part of our time today, which is a revealing request. That's what comes next, a revealing request. Uh, psychologists and those who study this sort of thing say that every human being dreams. In fact, we all dream multiple times every night. Can anybody here remember the dream they had last night? You want to share it? No, I'm just kidding. Um, we all dream every night. Well, a number of years ago, I was, I was taking a class in, um, a graduate class in psychology, and it was one portion of a textbook was about dreams, and uh, the author, in the process of that, w- said there, gave a little technique and said that everybody can learn to remember their dreams. Every, every, any average person can learn to remember their dreams in the morning. Most of us don't uh, because we don't try. So I, I, I said, I'll try that. Sounds interesting. So I practiced this little technique. It's pretty simple. Uh, and the first night I tried it, I remembered nothing. The next second night, I remembered one dream. Clear as a bell. The whole dream. Next night I tried it, I remembered three separate dreams. Complete dreams. Completely different from each other. The third night... Seven distinct dreams in one night, I remembered. I had to stop doing it because I couldn't sleep anymore because it was all these dreams. But one of those dreams I still remember very clearly. I was in a really tall building, like a skyscraper in a large city, like the Sears Tower, or whatever it's called today, down in Chicago. And I was on the very top of it. I, there was glass all around. I could, I could look out over a vast city. So I was like over this whole city, and I was sitting at this really important-looking round table in this room, and sitting at this table were seven men. I don't know their names, but I knew in the dream that they were the seven richest, most powerful men in the world. And I was leading a Bible study <laughs> at that table in that room. I, it was way before I went to seminary, before I knew I'd be a pastor, I just had this dream. It was a weird kind of ambition, I think, that I had. Look at this ambition. By the way, I haven't met any of those guys yet, unless, <laughs> unless you're holding out on me, some of you. Um, Look at the ambition of James and John, verse 37. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, understand understand what they're thinking. You have to understand the ancient world. They thought in terms of kingdoms. So the king had his throne, and just to one side, there was somebody sitting, and just to the other side. Whoever sat in those two seats had enormous power, influence, and honor. That's what they were thinking. They wanted one of those seats. In fact, That's how the New Testament refers to Jesus himself. In Luke 22, Jesus refers to himself as sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Paul, in Romans chapter 8, says that Jesus sits at the right hand of God. That's the imagery. So James and John wanted that for themselves. They wanted positions of honor, authority, and significance in the kingdom. Now, that's not a bad thing. It means they recognize Jesus is the Messiah. They recognize that he's king. They recognize that he has glory, and they want to be part of it. They want to be close to it. The truth is, that's how we all are as human beings. We all want to be close to glory. That's how celebrity works in our culture. If a, a, a worldwide or nationwide celebrity walked in here today, there would be a jockeying to see who could be closer to that person. There would be a, a crowd gather because we're drawn to it. We want to be part of that glory. Uh, that's how uh, like a basketball team works. If you watch a basketball game, uh, the guys are on the floor, then there's all these guys on the bench, and they're always jockeying so who can sit closer to the coach. I was that guy in college. I was way down at the end of the bench, and every time there was a timeout, I'd try to move a seat up closer, a seat up closer. Because if you're closer to the coach, you're significant. If you're way down at the end, eh, not so much. That's how airplanes work. Everybody wants to sit in first class. Right? Everybody wants a good seat. That's what James and John want. They want glory and honor, but they want it for themselves. And they try to get it by demanding it. They haven't yet learned and understood that the pathway to significance and glory lies in a different direction. And that leads us to the third point today, which is a call to discipleship. A call to discipleship. Uh, I remember seeing a story years ago about the famous golfer Tiger Woods earlier in his career, at the peak of his career, before he went and got into all the personal troubles. Uh, he was at a practice, uh, a practice uh, range somewhere hitting golf balls, and some young fan came up and got close enough to him and um, shouted out to him just in, like, uh, excitement, Hey, Tiger, I want to be just like you. And usually he would just ignore something like that and go on hitting golf balls. But something, for some reason, he stopped that day, and he walked over to this young man, a boy, really, and said, um, no, you don't. 
you don't want to be like me unless you're willing to come out here every day and hit a thousand golf balls until your hands bleed and do it over and over again. You don't want to be like me. Look at what Jesus says to these young guys. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Now what's Jesus talking about here? When he says, can you drink the cup I drink, he's talking about his coming suffering. In Matthew 26, the night that he's arrested, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays. And this is what he says, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. The cup is the suffering of the cross. What does he mean when he says, can you be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? He's talking here about his death. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? See, what Jesus is teaching these young guys is he's revealing to them the kind of king that he is. He's not the king that relies on his power and his position to dominate or to intimidate. He's the king that gives himself in love and sacrifice for our salvation. So the pathway to glory, he says, is going to lead him through suffering and death. But James and John, they still don't understand. And we know that by their answer. They say, we can, we can. All they want is the good seats. They haven't heard a word of what he says. So Jesus says to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Now, the one thing we know about this is that Jesus appears to be pointing toward how their lives, James and John's life, will be lived out. We know that James became the first of the martyrs of the 11 remaining apostles after Judas' death. In Acts chapter 12, we read that Herod had James put to the sword. He was the first one to die because he followed Jesus. John, the apostle John, was not martyred. The only one of the 11 not martyred because of his following Christ was John. He lived a long life, but he was thrown into prison and exiled by the Roman emperor. He knew what suffering was. That's what Jesus is talking about, the cup and the baptism. Then the whole conversation changes. Verse 41, when the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Now, why do you think the 10, these are the other 10 of the 12, why do you think they're indignant? Were they offended on behalf of Jesus that these guys barged up and out? No. They're upset that these guys got to the front of the line, that they thought about it first. And so Jesus calls them all together to have a little chat, and we are privileged to hear what he had to teach. Verse 42, Jesus called them all together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, thinking about the Roman structure of authority, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Now I want you to see Jesus does two things here. First, he explains the nature of true greatness. And second, he issues a call to discipleship, to following him. First, true greatness. What I notice here is that Jesus has no issue with James and John wanting to be great, with wanting to be near glory. He's got no issue with that. What he does have an issue with is their definition of greatness. He wants to challenge and redefine what they think greatness is. See, the world always has, and our culture today still defines greatness as power, talent, and accomplishment. Greatness. We think of world History figures like Alexander the Great conquered kingdoms, slaughtered thousands. The Great. We think of sports heroes like Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player. Know his nickname? The Great One. The Great One. Because he scored lots of goals. Of course. Jesus says true greatness is not found in position or accomplishment or talent. It's found in, of all things, servanthood. He says, verse 43, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great, 
Among you must be your servant. See, the issue is not wanting to be great. The issue is the definition and the direction of greatness. And then comes his call, the call to follow him, the call of discipleship. For even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, here's what he wants these 12 young guys to know. Here's what he wants us to know today. True greatness, true significance, even glory is only found and experienced in his call to follow, his call to discipleship. And he wants us to know that that true greatness comes at a great cost. What's the cost of discipleship? What's the cost? Well, it's the death of misplaced selfish ambition. It's the death of living for your own kingdom, for yourself. Now, ambition is not bad. Jesus wants us to consider the direction of our ambition. Are we climbing up the ladder of what our culture says is success and achievement and wealth? Or are we climbing down the ladder that Jesus says leads to true greatness? Servanthood. As Jesus came to serve us, he says, so we serve him. We follow him by serving others. So that's the cost he wants us to know. But there is good news. With that call and with that cost comes a promise. Because the same Jesus who said, can you drink the cup, says this in John chapter 10. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. That's the promise of the gospel. The promise of new heart through the forgiveness of sin, that's what the cross is all about. The promise of new identity by being adopted as his children. The promise of new purpose by living for his kingdom. And the promise of new destiny, living forever with him in the new heaven and new earth. That's the promise that brings us new life, life that is abundant. And then he adds to it, In John chapter 15, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. A life of joy. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm calling you to a life of true greatness. Have you ever thought about that? Do you know that Jesus wants your life to be great? He wants you to live a life that is great a life full of significance, a life full of meaning, but not greatness as defined by the cultural measuring sticks of wealth or or status or talent or position, but greatness measured by love and service and generosity and sacrifice. A life invested in his eternal kingdom. So the cost of following is great. But the promise is greater even than we can imagine. My brother Joe is a pastor in Ohio, and he loves to tell a story of years ago when he was a a brand new youth pastor working with uh, high school students. He had been on a mission trip, I think, in the Dominican Republic. And on the way home, uh, after a week of service where they were building a, a, a facility that would serve some of the poorest children in the Western Hemisphere, he was headed back on an airplane, and he happened to be sit- seating next to uh, an impeccably dressed, what he assumed, businessman. And he was, my brother was wearing kind of uh, rumpled clothes that came out of a long trip. His shoes were caked with mud and concrete dust, and he was unshaven, and he said probably smelled. But he's on this trip back, and sh- sooner or later, he starts up a conversation with this guy. And he finds out he's an executive of the Fortune 500 company. The guy in, goes into great detail. Uh, about what he does for the company, how large it is, and so forth. He's wearing a beautiful suit, polished shoes, gold watch. And then just to be polite, eventually the guy asks my brother, so what do you do? And he says, well, I'm I'm a student pastor at a church. And and he said the guy with with almost almost offensive disinterest said, oh, good for you, and went back to whatever he was doing. And my brother said that typically that would have made him mad. And he would have wanted to confront, but he said he, 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 said he, he wasn't mad. He said he, he, it, it confused him. He said, I wasn't angry. He said, I wasn't, I wasn't envious of the guy's obvious success. He said, I sat there trying to figure out what I felt. And then he realized what he felt was a kind of pity. He felt sad. 
for the guy, for this man. He felt sad for a life lived in smallness of heart and emptiness, climbing a ladder of success and wealth. And he felt overwhelming gratitude for the privilege of being called to follow the one who could promise him true greatness and true significance. So as we all stand together to, at the end of one year, looking into a new year, New Year's in, in a couple of days, there are two things I think that are true for every single one of us. Every single one of us. The first is we all are giving our lives to something. Every single one of us is giving our lives right now to something. Human beings can't help but do that. That's how we're wired up. You give your life to something. If you don't know what that is, you should probably ask yourself. The second thing we all want, all of us want, we all want greatness. We want a life of meaning and purpose and joy. And here in this little conversation, Jesus is telling us that true greatness, true life, true joy is following him downward into servanthood. So the question he would ask us at the beginning of 2019 in a couple of days is the same question he asked those two young, ambitious, bright-eyed men years ago. So, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? You bow with me as I close. Lord, we thank you today for your word, for this beautiful little interaction with these men that you loved. We thank you for the question you asked them so long ago. What do you want me to do for you? And if we're honest, we all want many things, and so often we settle for wanting lesser things. Help us to want what you want to give. Lives of true greatness, lives of service, lives invested in your kingdom that produce your glory. Thank you for calling us to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.